I am here to talk about uh, control flow integrity on RISC V. Um, it's on now. Most of the time, people used to call something like debug, and they said it like they're saying my name. And a couple of people actually gave me the name, so it just stuck to me. So I just go by the handle debug uh, in case someone was curious. Um, uh, I'm a security engineer at uh, Revos. It's a it's a startup which is uh, which is working in uh, data center space, um, trying to use RISC-V architecture to uh, target certain uh, enterprise workloads. Uh, Previously, I did uh, security engineering at AWS, Intel, and McAfee. Uh, mostly worked on like security for foundational technologies. Or uh, at Intel, I worked on ISA definitions like uh, Intel CET, short for Control Flow in Enforcement Technology, or uh, uh, defining hypervisor uh, uh, enforced linear address translation, which is primarily for things like uh, mitigate against page table kind of attacks. And of course, everyone here has probably worked on side channel mitigations. Um, so don't have an agenda slide, but uh, we're going to talk about uh, what is CFI. And most of the people over know about it. And then we're going to move on to some RISC-V specific stuff. And then uh, we're going to talk about how RISC-V architecture is trying to solve the problem. And then what is the status on like enabling in kernel and software? So first of all, what is RISC-V and uh, why RISC-V? Uh, RISC-V is an open standard instruction set architecture that came out of UC Berkeley. Five basically stands for the fifth version. Um, and uh, it was created at Berkeley for primarily education and research purposes because there wasn't a any open source, open source ISA at the, uh, until at that point of time. Uh, why? Because you don't have to be a lot, pay a lot of money to uh, ISA stakeholders. Uh, and the other reason is uh, the ISA has been uh, developed in such a way that it is extensible and composable. Uh, so you can pick and choose. Uh, uh, it is governed by an organization called as RISC-V International. And, uh, uh, most of the uh, industry partners basically become member organizations of that, and they collaboratively work to, uh, together to make uh, uh, new ISA extensions if they need one. Um, so it's it's kind of a open source uh, for CPU design and things like that. Uh, memory safety. We just saw Key's talk about uh, unsigned integer overflows. Uh, that's where it starts most of the time. Uh, and it ends up being uh, touching invalid memory, which usually is good if it crashes, because that's when you have only denial of service. Uh, but if it, someone knows about such bugs beforehand, then what they can do is they can hijack the control flow and, uh, and uh, uh, perform remote code execution kind of attacks uh, uh, on the systems. Um, I have linked to the, uh, in general, memory safety issues and what are the implications uh, because of those in the slide. So you can look at them later on. Uh, I am very terrible at making diagrams, but I try to make one. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a very simple visualization of uh, how indirect control transfers happen in programs. And this is like non-architecture specific. Imagine you have a C++ program and you have a base class which is calling some method. Now, it is usually done as a runtime binding, depending on which derived object you're calling. Uh, your indirect call is uh, placed there. So it's, it's a call which is based on a memory parameter. And if that memory parameter is subject to some corruption, an attacker can uh, go anywhere in the address space. So in this diagram, the blue arrow is basically showing that programmer wanted to go that to that particular place in the address space of the program. But if the memory parameter on which this indirect call is happening can be corrupted, then an attacker can go at any instruction granularity uh, in the address space of the program. Uh, similarly, for the return, return are 
by definition always uh, uh, based on the memory operands. So whenever you are returning from a function, you are getting a value from the stack, which you would have pushed when you had done the function call. Um, so the idea here is to, idea here is to set up the, that, you know, the, the problem is uh, 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 memory which is corruptible, and if you're doing certain control flow transfers in the address, uh, address space, uh, they need some uh, granularity. And it's not like this problem has not been faced by other architectures or uh, people don't know about this issue. Uh, that, uh, there has been a lot of software work which exists in the, uh, in the industry in, in, in form of LLVM CFI, SafeStack, and Microsoft's Control Flow Guard, uh, which basically tries uh, all of these approaches uh, try to use instrumentation, ensure that all the call sites during the, during the compile phase itself or the return sites uh, are, are checking wherever they are going. And, uh, and then recent, more recently, x86 came up with control flow enforcement technology, which is uh, basically uh, end branch uh, instruction for forward control flow and shadow stack for backward control flow. ARM64 also uh, came up with uh, BTI. BTI stands for branch target identifier, which uh, enforces that if you have an indirect branch, uh, you must always land on these, uh, this landing pad instruction called as BTI. PAC is uh, pointer authentication codes, which uh, tries to mitigate the corruption issues uh, by itself. So that has been uh, one of the mitigation as well. Uh, Another hardware mitigation that ARM recently has came up with the uh, guarded control stack, which is pretty much a shadow stack, uh, a protected uh, range in the address space of the program. So the whole idea is that uh, you, you, you got to protect the forward flow and the backward flow. For forward flow, you have to make sure that wherever you are landing, uh, there has to be certain granularity on that. And there has to be uh, 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 a specific instruction that CPU is waiting for. And for the backward control flow, you you uh, you can use the shadow stack for a finer finer grained uh, return control flow. Okay, so some Risk Five uh, basics. Uh, Risk Five is an architecture with, uh, and again, like we can't go into the details of everything. Risk Five. I have only put the slides which are, uh, you know, which can help in this presentation. So Risk Five has uh, 32 general purpose registers. Uh, they start from X0 to X31. And X0 is basically equivalent to slash dev slash null on Linux. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a register which is immutable, so you can't change the register. It always uh, is zero. And uh, for program counter, you have, you have PC, which is kind of equivalent to RIP on x86. Um, uh, you might have noticed that there is no stack pointer, there is no link register, so that comes from the calling convention. So RISC-V has this calling convention which is used by compiler to uh, generate the code. So in terms of calling convention, uh, X1 is the register which is termed as RA, meaning return address. So whenever you are making a function call, your return address is always placed into the RA so that the uh, function which is called it can save the return address somewhere. X2 is the stack pointer, which is equivalent to stack pointer on x86. Uh, so whenever code is generated, compiler is going to make sure that uh, uh, X2 register is pointing to the stack prepared by operating system for you. And similarly, uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm, I'm just going through a bunch of them. T0, T2 is basically temporary registers, which are basically meaning that they, they don't need to be preserved across calls. Uh, and uh, similarly, we have T3 to T6. Uh, so the, the register space is from calling convention perspective is segmented into these uh, uh, multiple segments. Uh, and compiler basically uses them for, for uh, generating code. Instructions and addressing in RISC-V. Uh, unlike x86, RISC-V, is not that much into variable instructions uh, length. Uh, like on x86, you can have one byte instruction and a 16 byte instruction as well. Uh, in RISC-V, you can have either a four byte instruction or a two byte instruction. For simplicity, I'm only showing here four byte instruction formattings. 
And uh, uh, what that limits is that uh, uh, how much immediate uh, values you can program into the register, uh, into the instruction itself. So that limits uh, immediate programming to maximum 20 bit. As you can see that the J type instruction, which is the last one, uh, is the one which is giving you space to program something like uh, 20 bits. Um, but uh, RISC-V has uh, uh, something uh, which is called as AUI PC, which, is, uh, uh, which allows you to do a PC relative offset addition in the upper 20 bits of register. So this allows it to basically uh, address plus minus two GBs uh, from, the, from the program counter. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the other part that I wanted to talk about in the instruction formatting is uh, inputs and outputs. Um, as we earlier saw in the previous slide, we have X0 to X31 registers, 32, bit, uh, 32 registers, and uh, instruction itself provides space to encode what are the source registers, what are the destination registers. So RS1 and RS2, which you can see on screen, are uh, source registers. RD is destination. And uh, they are uh, assigned five bits. So you can encode any destination register uh, using those five bits between X0 to X32. And same for sources. And depending on which instruction formatting you are using, uh, uh, the source and destination can be different. So uh, I wanted to run you through like a couple of examples here. So as an example here, uh, the first example is AUI PC X6, immediate, some immediate value of 20 bit, and then a load, from X, a load into X1 register uh, from X6 and some offset. So what, what this assembly is actually doing is, uh, it's uh, AUI, this AUI PC instruction is actually uh, this J type instruction, the last one in the uh, in the slide, in which there is some opcode assigned for AU, AUI PC, and RD is uh, programmed to point to X6, and then you have some 20 bit uh, immediate. Uh, so what happens by this instruction is in RD you you add this immediate value on the top 20 bits of current program counter. So you basically have a reach of plus minus two GB. So if there is a data section in the program address space, uh, you can reach that through, through your program counter. And the load is, LD is basically load a double word, uh, SW is store a word, uh, and so on. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, JLR because that's the one uh, which is a control transfer, indirect control transfer instruction on RISC V. Uh, so JLR is uh, is actually uh, uh, I type instruction in which uh, you are basically saying that I want to go to the address which is present in RS one register and save the return at, uh, save the subsequent PC program counter and RD register. So in this case, what we are saying is that uh, go to JLR, uh, uh, go to an address pointed to by X8, and whatever is the next PC, save that in X1. So uh, at ISA level, this is, this is a basic primitive um, to, to perform uh, indirect control transfers. Now, coming back to software conventions, uh, and the reason we are talking about software conventions is because uh, uh, if you remember in one of the previous slides, uh, th there are software conventions on, Ris on RISC-V about which registers means what. So, so if, we, if we see that there is only one indirect co control transfer instruction on RISC-V, which is uh, JLR, but depending on what are you programming in source register or destination register, they are, they can be called something else. So uh, like a function call is usually when you're saying that destination is RA register or a T0 register. So these are termed as link registers on RISC-V. So whenever you say that I want to go to an address which is present in register T1, but at the same time save the return address in RA register. So from convention perspective, that's a call. 
when you really don't want to save any return address, you are actually doing a jump, and in that case, your RD becomes X0, because that was the immutable register. Function returns are basically saying that uh, uh, JLR X0 RA, which means that uh, uh, go to the address uh, which is pointed by RA register, but I really don't want to worry about uh, saving the return address. So that becomes JLR X0 RA. Um, we talked about, uh, so there is one special case which is, uh, uh, which is a indirect jump call, but actually is a direct jump. Uh, and that that is because RISC V has this limitation of 20-bit immediate. So uh, you really can't uh, 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 you really can't do direct jumps more than uh, plus minus uh, one MB. Direct jumps are uh, encoded by uh, I think. Uh, which one was that? Yeah, direct jumps are, I think, J-type, uh, in which you are basically going, uh, 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 doing a direct uh, equivalent of uh, x86. Um, where was this? So, so when uh, when you are limited by plus minus one MB offset, uh, uh, you really can't do uh, uh, direct jump, which is farther than this offset. And in that case, what compiler on RISC-V does is it uh, employs this mechanism in which it calculates the offset using AUI PC instruction, which we earlier talked about, and then tries to go there. But if you look at both of these instructions together, it's actually a direct call. This is not a memory-based operand. What it is doing is, in this first instruction, AUI PC array some offset. So in this example, if you look at, I have provided the offset as, offset as well, uh, PC address, which is 70107A. And uh, since it is adding the adding into the upper 20 bits, it is shifting the immediate value by 12 bits and then adding it. It is a sign uh, addition. So it becomes 1007A. And the next instruction is JLR uh, sum offset and the register, which becomes 102, uh, 102E0. So this is kind of a plus minus 2GB direct jump if you look at these two instructions together. So, and this, this information is gonna be useful in the next slides. Uh, uh, because even though this looks like uh, an indirect jump, uh, it is actually a direct jump here because you are calculating the offset statically. All right. So coming to uh, CPU extension uh, for forward control uh, 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 control flow. Uh, yeah, first, first, first let's talk about this string ZICFILP. So this is the naming convention on RISC-V. Uh, ZI specifically means that unprivileged integer. CFI stands for CFI, control flow integrity, and LP is the string for landing pad. So. Uh, uh, it, what basically the string extension string name itself should be self-explanatory and should present that whether it is part of a privileged uh, I suspect or unprivileged I suspect. So that's what it is saying here. Um, what ZICFI, uh, if, if a CPU is implementing this extension, what it says is that it enforces all the indirect branches must land on a LPAD instruction, which is equivalent of N branch on x86. Uh, with a matching label, uh, except when your RS1 is RA, T0, or T2. So uh, if we look at the previous slide, when compiler uses plus minus 2GB offsets, uh, as a convention, it uses RA or T0 register, like existing code, that's what it uses uh, uh, for, all, for all these kind of uh, more than uh, one MB offset direct uh, calls. So that's, that kind of frees up the compiler from using RA for generating those kind of uh, uh, direct calls, and at the same time does not require a landing pad at the target. Um, we talked about a matching label. What matching label means that is this new instruction LPAD uh, is designed so that it has, you can program an immediate value uh, as part of the instruction itself. 
and uh, and uh, at the call site you set up some label value in in a register which uh, which the, according to this uh, isa extension must be uh, t2 register which is uh, by software convention it was uh, x7 so uh, when cpu does not uh, is not able to match uh, the contents of t2 with the label programmed in the lpad uh, lpad instruction then it's going to raise a is a fault uh, it's, the fault is basically a software check exception on risk 5 and the tval is here equivalent of something error code on uh, uh, x86 so it's like extra information telling cpu or uh, telling software that why this why did this software check exception happen um, here is some example so this is a call site in which you are setting some label value in t2 register and performing an indirect jump and at the target, you must have a label which must have a label value is equal to one. And then your rest of the function body starts. Uh, here is the second example, which is using T2, which is exempt from any uh, landing pad. So here you are placing some PC relative offset, and then you are doing a jump there. Uh, now, no label is accept, uh, uh, ex expected at this uh, in this flow. Uh, ZI CFI SS is uh, protecting the return flow using shadow stack. Uh, it, uh, because shadow stack can be anywhere in the address space and it can be discontiguous because there can be multiple threads in a, in a single address space. Uh, uh, you, need, you need a way of telling CPU that this is a shadow stack which cannot be uh, tampered with regular store instructions. So uh, there is a new page table bit to, uh, uh, in the ISA extension to make sure that the Shadow stack is not writable, um, uh, but uh, it can be writable using only shadow stack instructions, which are mentioned here as uh, SS push or SS AMO swap. AMO swaps basically means that atomically swapping a value on, on the shadow stack. SS pop check is a uh, instruction which is going to pop a value from the sh uh, shadow stack and uh, match it with, the, with one of the RS1 register, and if they don't match, it's gonna fault. Uh, SS uh, RDP is equivalent to uh, 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 read uh, read the current uh, shadow stack pointer, and uh, and yeah, the extension itself uh, introduces a new register in the ISA, which is called as SSP register uh, shadow stack pointer. Uh, so that's on top of the existing GPRs. Um, now, when you have a program compiled with these uh, uh, ZI CFI SS. Uh, and LP as well, your functions will have landing pad at the start with a label value and uh, SS push RA because whoever called it must have uh, made sure that uh, return address is placed in RA. And in the epilog, uh, before returning, what your function, uh, function should be doing is SS pop check RA. Uh, it must have loaded RA from the regular stack earlier uh, in, this in this step. And SS pop check is basically going to pop from the shadow stack, uh, match that contents with RA. If they don't match, it's going to raise a software check exception uh, with a with an error code of three. If it doesn't fall, then you can basically uh, do a return. Um, there are uh, additional things that I wanted to talk about uh, with respect to shadow stack. Um, uh, so left side is uh, assume your program was already using shadow stack and uh, uh, in general, only shadow stack instructions uh, only shadow stack instructions are allowed to uh, access shadow stack. So SS, SS push, SS pop check, or SS AMO swap. So the blue lines are representing the valid accesses, and the red lines are representing invalid accesses. So what it means is that uh, when your program is running, any uh, any SS push uh, or SS pop check or SS AMO swap kind of accesses that are happening, they must happen only on shadow stack. If they happen on any read write memory or read write execute memory or even execute memory, that will result into access fault. Access fault is kind of a, is kind of a fatal fault on uh, risk five. So operating system basically takes uh, drastic measures, measures for the program which is uh, resulting into access faults. Um, because there is no need for uh, these instructions to work on a read write uh, 
or read write execute or execute memory so that's that's the inbuilt into the isa that these are these will result into access faults so that nobody can pivot into non shadow stack memory um as uh, similarly we don't want regular store instructions which is basically sw here to write into shadow stack uh, so uh, all these instructions uh, attempting to write into shadow stack type of memory is going to result into access fault um but there is an interesting case here uh, there are two interesting cases here one is uh, how do you do cow because uh, when you have we are running programs you are doing forking and cloning all the time and in that case your address space is cloned and uh, how do you perform cow on shadow stack memory and by default what kernel does is it marks the pages uh, read only and in this case shadow shadow uh, shadow stack range will also be marked as read only uh, what happens when the subsequent ss push or ss pop check or ss amo swap happens on that range in the new clone task uh, so for that uh, what isa does is uh, if there is a ss push ss pop check or ss amo swap operation and uh, it is uh, dealing with a read only memory it all it does is it raises a store fault because it assumes that uh, uh, this this condition can only be done by uh, uh, by a fork or a clone and uh, operating system already knows what vma this was and it can uh, program the right permission bits and uh, resume the instruction and loads are allowed on the shadow stack because it is going to be useful for stack tracing and things like that um i'm going to go th go through this one fast but we can talk about this one later on as well after the talk because i think we are running out of time uh ss amo swap is uh, is designed for uh, asynchronous software uh, and what i mean by that is you have signal handling in kernel in which uh, your control flow gets hijacked at some point of time and then it goes somewhere else similarly in high level languages like rust and go you have concept of async await green threads in which you are uh, basically constantly switching the stack uh, for uh, uh, for for these kind of asynchronous flows and Uh, quite often uh, attackers use these kind of uh, asynchronous flows to to do stack pivoting and and eventually perform uh, uh, control flow hijacking and if shadow stack were to be enabled for these flows uh, shadow stack is, will also have to be switched and uh, the way to switch shadow stack should be not just switching a stack pointer uh, shadow stack pointer but uh, some way of securely doing that and there is a concept uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, basically storing certain certain kind of tokens on the shadow stack which you can verify whenever you are switching so as, as long as runtimes has that that mechanism of uh, uh, storing the tokens and validating those tokens before actually switching to the shadow stack uh, it it provides uh, extra security assurance uh, ss amo swap basically helps with that flow by uh, storing and validating those tokens in a atomic way on the shadow stack so that uh, uh, there are no concurrency issues in terms of this uh, validation flow okay key isa distinctions that uh, risk 5 has is uh, 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 unlike other architectures where your sh your return address is pushed onto the shadow stack as part of the call instruction that's not uh, what risk 5 does in case of risk 5 you have specific something uh, you know ss push instruction so compiler emits that code in in your function prolog uh, what it gives to the uh, software workloads is that all the leaf functions which are not spilling uh, return addresses they can uh, they don't have to store that address somewhere in the uh, in the shadow stack so uh, you know c++ workloads which have lots of getters and setters uh, and there are lots of leaf functions you can uh, uh you can get some performance back from there um shadow stack uh, because there is no implicit push and pop of the uh as part of call and return it allows mixing of the, the dso's in the address space so if if a dso does not have shadow stack compiled in it it's not going to result into any issues uh, you can easily mix and match that um landing pad uh, is basically uh, landing pad key a key isa distinction is that it allows fine grain assistance so label value is programmed into the lpad instruction uh, which basically means that you don't have a branchy code in your prolog where you are checking the the label value of where you are coming from okay 
This is the status of the RISC V CFI user mode enabling. Uh, we have posted uh, uh, V3 patches uh, on the kernel mailing list, uh, which, uh, and thanks to like uh, a lot of uh, existing work from uh, Rick uh, on the x86 side, that we have been able to use that uh, that work to enable these patches. Uh, uh, these patches basically do feature discovery and activation. Uh, one part which is uh, interesting is that uh, as we are developing this, we have found that there are lots of common flows between uh, ARM64, ShadowStack, x86, and even RISC-V. So one attempt is uh, trying to get uh, to do as much as Arch agnostic code for these things. Uh, and as part of that, we are, uh, we are we have at least settled on some generic PRCTL to enable these features on uh, uh, on the binaries. Um, in terms of testing, what we have done is we have built up uh, build root uh, rootfs using ShadowStack and LandingPad and able to boot to the shell. There is a demo. I don't know if you'll get to see that. <laughs> uh, yes. So RISC five kernel control for integrity. Um, uh, we have posted RFC patches for this to LKML. Uh, for forward CFI, uh, uh, it's it's as simple as uh, you have to compile the kernel with uh, with this compiler flag. And for backward CFI, we are hooking on something called as config shadow call stack, which exists in kernel today for ARM64 uh, and even for RISC-V. RISC what this this config does is it prepares a software shadow stack. Which is writable, uh, and uh, there is a compiler instrumentation in Clang, I think, uh, which uh, stores the return addresses uh, into this software shadow stack as part of the prologue and epilogue. It uh, pops it up. Uh, so we are basically use, hooking into that existing flow to enable hardware-based shadow stack on RISC V, and it works pretty good. Within like uh, 12 patches, uh, we are able to enable this uh, KCFI for RISC V kernel. Uh, I did some label collision analysis as well. That uh, because and these these labels are calculated over uh, as the MD5 hash of the function signatures, just to check uh, how much uh, how much label uh, loss we f we see as we reduce the number of bits. Uh, to store the label, because as of now, as we talked, that there are risk five has only 20 bit immediates available. So the label uh, that uh, that you can store uh, that you can program is 20 bit. And this is like a very rough analysis that I have done. I used LLVM uh, dump AST feature to grab the function signatures and then calculated MD5 hash hashes over them. Um, this is a small cute graph uh, that I was able to make. Uh, what it means, th these percentage means, is that uh, uh, so here is the unique prototypes, and between the unique hashes, when we truncated it to 20 bit, uh, how many of them still remained u unique? So, like for C++ uh, sources in the file, uh, it was a 12 percent loss. For C files, it was 3 percent. Um, and so on for all of them. I have two different bullets for CPP and C because uh, I was having some issues uh, when I was doing the AST dump because for CPP it was all coming out mangled. So I like basically tried to separate them apart. Um, average, we compiled spec 20, uh, 2006 binaries. Average code size growth that we saw due to the feature was 1.91%. And there is still scope of optimizations to further reduce this growth. Uh, average indirect gadget redu reduction is something which is uh, existing metric used to calculate how many gadgets uh, have you uh, indirect gadgets have you reduced in the program address space. Um, so we calculated that that came out to be 99.43 percent, but that exists for other KCFI or other CFI schemes as well. Uh, there are more details about these numbers in the spreadsheet, which I have linked over here. Uh, these are the CFI repos that I have. Um, uh, ISA specification is over here. There's a compiler support, which is uh, uh, which we are getting a hell lot of help from Sci5. Um, QMU support, kernel patches for user CFI, and RFC patches for kernel CFI. Uh, okay, do you want to see a demo? 
otherwise we can take questions and answers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, talk to me if you wanna if you're interested in the discussing anything about this. Thank you.